Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Hope you guys are all doing well out there. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we are continuing along in our uh, series that we've been doing called Effects on Violin. We've been at this for, uh, for a hot minute here. We're on week five. And I was just telling somebody the other day, I was, I'm looking at what's coming. I'm probably going to take a little break after this week, get us through the holidays. And then starting in January, we'll pick back up. I think I've got about 10 more weeks or so in the hopper right now. And we're going to be covering everything from like uh, distortion. Um, what else we got? We got some synth stuff in there. We're going to be talking about wah. We've even got a week on TalkBox. We've got a, a different week with all these different effects that we're going to be talking about. And most of these are going to have special guests on them. And uh, really looking forward to those getting a chance to talk with a bunch of my buddies um, about this sort of thing. Pitch shifting. We'll probably do two weeks on pitch shifting, uh, one on octaves and one on non octaves, just because, you know, why not? And I've got some really awesome artists uh, for each one of those. What's up, William and Karen? Thank you guys for being here. Um, in fact, I even had a discussion this week, um, this week, like today, with somebody on Facebook talking about compression. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about compression today. And uh, there was there's some, uh, some uh, people are misunderstanding what compression is and how it works. Uh, they were not agreeing that compression sounds good on violin. I've got, I'm like, I've got really bad news for you. Every recording you've ever heard of violin has probably a minimum of three compression stages on it. A minimum of three. Uh, so yeah, compression sounds just fine on violin. Believe me, uh, every violin you've ever heard, if you've heard it recorded, has been compressed. Um, so one of the things that you will hear a lot if you are a violinist playing in a live rock and roll setting, uh, you've heard something like this. You're playing in a bar and you're kind of comping a little bit, you're laying back a little bit in the mix, right? I can't hear the fiddle! Yeah, if I could dance, I wouldn't have to be in a band. Um, so a lot of times we're kind of laying back a little bit, we're blending, we're not like pedal to the metal. And people are like, oh, I can't hear the fiddle. It's because it's, you know, we've got a pretty wide dynamic range. If we throw a little compression on there, though. So we can still have expression. We can still have some dynamic range but we can also get it to where it now sits nicer in the mix and you can hear everything that you're playing, just not the notes that you're playing as, as hard as you can. Okay. So just a little recap in this series, we're doing the effects on violin series right now. This is week five. We're going to hit a different effect each week. Talk about what those effects are and how to use them. This is kind of a recap of what we've done so far with some of the special guests that we've had and, uh, Mucho propos to uh, Timothy and Andrea for being here with us. And so let's get to compression, right? Um, what exactly is it? It's what it says it is. It compresses or shrinks the dynamic range of the signal that you're sending to front of house. And this is like we talked about high pass filters a few weeks ago. It's not a brick wall, unless you want it to be. It's not a brick wall. It doesn't take all the expression out. And it, it doesn't uh, squash your sound and take the life out of it unless you use it wrong. So how can we use it correctly, right? Now, string instruments, violins, violas, cellos have a huge dynamic range. And, and in many contexts, that dynamic range is too large. It is the quiets are too quiet and the louds are too loud. Because once you start playing with drums and guitars, you realize that they don't have as big a dynamic range as we do. Now, drums can. Drums can lay way back and just kind of tinkle a little bit here. But once a drummer starts playing a beat, there's not as much dynamic range there as you think. <coughs> and guitar players, if they're playing through an amp, a tube amp is a compressor. So it's going to squeeze their dynamic range down too 
and when a rock band is playing, there's not a huge amount of dynamics in there. And with the string players, uh, violin players, unless we're using some compression, our dynamic range is too big. So if we're gonna really dig in to take a solo, but then lay back, cause it's a four hour show, nobody's gonna be like, you know, pedal to the metal for four hours. Um, when we lay back to comp, it's usually gonna be too much. So that's gonna be a problem. Now, I'll, I'll, before I get to the next slide, I'll say that maybe people are saying, I can't hear you when you're comping. And you go, well, maybe the solution to that, Mr. Sound Engineer boy, uh, I'm, I'm gonna sandbag during sound check. Because what happens during sound check, the engineer says, give me the strongest thing that you're gonna give me all night. So you press the pedals, you play as hard as you're gonna play, and they say, okay, we're gonna set your maximum level on the board here, and then everything else is gonna be below that. And you go, well, I'm just gonna sandbag. I'm just gonna give them 70% of my volume, and then when I'm comping, it's gonna be plenty loud enough, right? And everybody's gonna hear that. Well, that's a great idea on paper. And for the first three or four songs of the night, when you're just comping, that's great, right? You're now in the mix, everything's good. People can hear you, it's nice, your mom's happy. And uh, we gotta make mom happy. So the problem is when you go to take that first solo and you jump on the gas, you're gonna clip out your channel because it's not set for you to play that loud. It's gonna distort and sound really horrible. And the sound engineer is gonna go, oh, I see how it is. So you are you were sandbagging on me. Now I'm gonna turn you down like a lot so that you're not gonna clip me out again, okay? So we're gonna pull you, Joseph Shackelford's here. What's happening, my man? So they're gonna pull you way back and now you're worse off than you would have been. Don't sandbag during the sound check. Nothing good comes from that, okay? So give them what they're asking for, but what we need to do is figure out a way to shrink your dynamic range so that your quiets are not too quiet and your louds are not too loud. Um, William, someone is asking about music to listen to while we wait. So we used to do that. And the problem is the music that we were using when I first put that little video together uh, was music I had not released yet. It was my stuff. And then I released it. And it, so now... The computer thinks that uh, it doesn't know. It's like, hey, there's a copyright on that music. I go, yeah, it's mine. Well, they don't know that. So I may have to come up with some non-copyrighted music to throw on the beginning there. I just haven't bothered. It's on my list. It's just not at the top. So with compression, we can set a volume threshold. And below that threshold, the compressor doesn't do anything. And above that threshold, it will lower our volume by some amount. Okay, and what does that look like? I'm a visual learner, so this is how I, I like to see things. Um, I'm gonna use several graphs here from the midnightmagicsounds.com website. Uh, they did a good job of putting these graphs together, and I was like, I will use their graphs. So here they are. If you've got uh, some stuff that you're curious about these, you can go check out midnightmagicsounds.com. It's a really good resource. So imagine that this is your violin signal. We got some loud notes, we got some quiet notes, right? We're gonna play with some dynamics because we're classically trained musicians. Um, we might put it, institute a new rule here too at the shop that um, you're only allowed to say that you're classically trained twice in any given phone call, just so you know. All right, um, I don't know what the penalty is gonna be uh, if you violate that, but yeah, it's fine. I don't know what it is. that. It, Sometimes people call and they feel like they've got to mention every 30 seconds that they're classically trained. You know, I get it. I, I, okay. Yeah. Good job. You can play Bach. Congratulations. Um, so imagine that this is your signal. We've got loud notes. We've got quiet notes. Let's set a threshold somewhere around here that above that we've, we've got to, we got to do a little something. The louds are too loud. So this, what we will say is that we are going to reduce those louds above that threshold by a certain ratio. And so we'll say, say a two to one ratio. So if I exceed that threshold by eight decibels, a two to one ratio would squeeze that down and say that now I'm only gonna exceed it by four decibels. Imagine there's a little tiny guy inside there with a the fader and he's just gonna chase your plan with the fader the way you expect your front of house guy to do and he's not gonna do by the way. So there's just a little guy in there with a the fader and every time you exceed that threshold, if it's a two to one ratio, He's gonna pull that little fader down so that you've only exceeded it by half as much as you wanted to exceed it by, okay? I could probably use that for my driving 
so speed limit and a ratio, but it wouldn't work. I, I would, I'd figure out a way around it. I didn't buy the GTI to drive like a little, little old lady. Um, so this is what happens if we compress. So we've got big, big differences between uh, louds and quiets with a compressor. We still have differences. We still have expression. We still have volume differences. They're just not as much. Okay. So that's what happens with a compressor. It squeezes that dynamic range down. And what does that do for us? It helps keep us in the same spot in the mix. So once we're audible, a little bit quieter, that's fine. We can still hear that. And a little bit louder, that's fine. It's not too loud. And the engineer no longer has to chase your fader. Unless you're Lindsey Sterling or you're Mia Asano or you're Jean-Luc Pani or you're one of the people that your name is the one that's on the sign outside, that engineer ain't chasing your fader. Probably you're in a band with a singer and the engineer is going to be willing to chase their fader, but he probably putting compression on them too. I mean, I only got so many fingers. I'm only going to chase so many of these faders and the violinist probably not on that list in most cases. So what's going to happen? They're, they're going to set to where your loudest is just right. And then if your quiets are too quiet, that's on you. Sorry. So, you know, we just, we, as a front of house guy, it's not that we're grumpy, even though we are, but that's not why I have a hundred other things to think about not just whether the violin is loud enough at all times. Believe it or not, that is not my only concern out there. Crazy, I know. The other thing it will do is help smooth out your playing a little bit. Your transients, you know, if we're doing ba ba doo ba da doo ba da doo ba that's those are going to be less strong than before. And rather than me just singing and gesticulating in front of the camera, because uh, that's a little weird, let's have a, uh, let's have a demonstration. How about this? We got technology. Let's do this. So this is a live logic session. I'm going to share my screen with you and let's listen to some, uh, some fiddle playing. All right. All right. Oh, that was so nice. So the problem is what you're hearing is a lot of ba -ba -doo -doo, ba -da -doo -doo, ba -da -doo, and those are, those are pretty strong. Now, if it's, if the fiddle's by himself or herself, that's fine. But if you're in a mix and you want to be heard above sort of a constant din of other instruments, what we may need to do is turn the compressor on. And then you can see here, we've got a threshold where we talked about threshold right here. It's set at minus 25 dB. The ratio is at two. I'm going to crank that up to say three, roughly three to one. And now we're going to play and you can see on this meter here, you will see gain reduction. It's how much that little guy is pulling down the fader inside the machine. You ready? Let's go. So you can still hear volume differences. There's still expression happening in there, but we've shrunk that dynamic range down. Here's another way to visualize right here. We'll put on a graph and this is, this will be a real time graph. You'll see it scrolling by and you will see. So the brown here or the gray, that's going to be the signal coming in. And then the white line is going to show you how much gain reduction there is. Okay. So that's another way to visualize what that gain reduction is. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next thing here and we will talk a little bit more about that in a second. All right. My computer is going to freak out momentarily. It's okay. Come back. Um, so what does this do? One of the things that it can do, it can be a little frustrating in your monitor. If you've got compression on your channel that you don't know about. Like I'm digging in and I'm playing louder, but it's not getting any louder and it can be a little frustrating. So if there is compression in your monitor, it is nice to know about. I don't personally like compression in my monitor. I want to be able to hear all the things I'm doing with the caveat understanding that there probably is a fair amount of compression on my signal out front so that the engineer can get me in that mix and get me sitting in there. 
but I do personally prefer to not have compression in my monitor. I want to be able to hear what I'm doing, but I have to understand that it's, it's going to have to be there out front. That's just, that's the reality of playing in a rock band. Okay. So let's go back here. We talked about threshold and ratio, those two knobs that you see right here. The next one over is called makeup. What is this makeup? Well, you could see that we were doing gain reduction, right? That little white line at the top and you could see the meters it was moving. That's how much gain we were reducing. We were pulling down those louds. And you go, yeah, you know what I've been thinking about that. You said that this makes it easier for them to hear me. If they're making me quieter, how does that make it easier to hear me? Well, we are shrinking. So if this is my quietest quiet, and we're not touching that because it's below the threshold. Here's the threshold and here's my loudest loud. We're shrinking that range down, but then I can move the whole thing up. So when your engineer is setting your gain at the beginning of the night during sound check, they want to hear the loudest loud. And then they're going to sort of set the gain on the board to where that's at the, at the peak of where they want your signal to be. So that's going to be your loudest loud. If this is my whole dynamic range, then, then my quiets are going to be pretty far down here. If my dynamic range is smaller and they set my loudest loud here, then that means that my quietest quiet actually comes up as they're setting that. So when I notice on my compressor here, say I, I see that, well, the most it's ever going to compress is, is 8 dB, or it's going to take 10 dB of gain reduction. Well, then I would go to that makeup knob and I would boost that by 10 dB. And that's what moves the bottom of my signal up 10 dB. That makes sense? So that's what makeup gain is. If I notice, wow, there sure is a lot of gain reduction on this channel. Well, then the makeup boosts it back up. Okay. The next thing you'll notice underneath, there's a knee, an attack, and a release. Well, here's what the knee looks like. Uh, and there's another graph from Midnight Magic Sounds. The knee is when we get to the threshold, does that, does the compressor kick in right there or does it start to kick in a little early and then it sort of doesn't go all the way full out until we're past it. And that way, do I hear that compressor start to work or do I put a soft or a kind of a medium knee on there so that, you know, when I set my threshold, we don't nothing, nothing, nothing happens. And then full compression, as soon as we break that, I actually like kind of a soft knee on there so that the compression starts to come in just before I get there. And then it's at a full compression level a little bit after I get there. That's going to make it a little more transparent. Okay. Uh, the next thing is attack time. It is how long after I exceed the threshold does a little guy with the fader pull it down. And this is an artistic decision. So you know, a lot of this is math but some of this is art. And one of the things in attack time, it depends on why I'm using this compression. If I'm using it to smooth out some of those really hard strokes that you get, if you're playing more of like a Celtic style, then I probably want a pretty fast attack time. I want it grabbing that thing right away. Is the instant that I cross the threshold, I want it, I want it pulled down. If I'm playing more smoothly, maybe I'm not playing quite as percussively as that, and I just want it as, as I'm going to take a solo, I want it to pull this thing down. I may slow that attack time down a little bit. That is a, uh, again, that's an artistic decision that you've got to make. If you have a slower attack time, and this is measured in milliseconds. If I have a slower attack time, it's going to let some more of my transients poke through. And it's as I articulate the beginning of a note, it's going to let that articulation pop through. And then it's going to sort of pull it down so it's not peeking out. Um, my channel. Does that make sense? And then release time is the opposite of that. Um, release time is, oops. Oh. Release time is just how long after I get back below the threshold, does it let go of the compression? All right. So one of the other things that compression does, and this is why guitar players use it, is that it causes sustain. Yeah. Uh, so the compressor is lowering my volume above the threshold, but once I get below the threshold, it's not touching it. And what happens is when I let go of my note, I play, and it sort of decays pretty fast after I take my bow off the string. 
if I, that would be this first diagram right, right here. That's what happens when I take the bow off the string. I get a pretty quick decay of my sound. Now look further over. That's what happens if I'm fairly compressed. I take the bow off the string, but it's still compressed. So I'm going to get la, and then it's going to pull out. So if I've used a fair amount of compression on my signal, um, when I take my bow off the string, I'm going to have a lot more sustain or if I pluck a note, I'm gonna get a lot more sustain. So if I want my violin to sustain more, compression can be used uh, not just for keeping me in the mix, it can be used as an artistic tool. Well, maybe I don't like the fact that a violin doesn't have much sustain on it when I play pits. You know, ding, 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 ding. If I want bing, bing, I want it to ring longer, like the way it rings on an open string, once, you, once you're playing and once you're fingering a note on the instrument, you know, those things die out pretty fast. If you want that to last longer, compression would be one way to do that. So, some pros and cons here, and then we're going to get to uh, some practical application. Pros and cons, it does help you stay in the mix, and it can smooth out your bow hand. If, you, if you've got, you know, you're a little attacky sometimes. Uh, instead of being you know, ba -da -da -da, it's more like da -da 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 -da. it can smooth that out, which is nice. On the flip side, it can squash the life out of your tone. And I think the person who was, we we're having a little discussion about this earlier, I think that's one of the things she was trying to argue. Like it can make your playing sound kind of lifeless. Yeah, if you use it wrong, it can. If, you're, if your threshold is set too low and your ratio is set too high, then you basically end up with a waveform that's just and there's, there's no dynamics in there at all. So your loudest loud is no louder than your quietest quiet. Well, th yes, that does take away some of the, uh, some of the expressive uh, tools that you have at your disposal. Now, understand, even if we've compressed it very hard, and I was talking to some other friends uh, about this just this afternoon, if, uh, if you're playing with a lot of dynamics, it's not just volume that changes, it's also timbre. So if you really pop into a note, that note isn't just louder than a note that you ease into, it also has a different timbre to it, it has a different sonic color. So we can keep all those sonic colors without having to worry about the fact that when I do da do 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 da do 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 da do sort of that Bachian thing, um, then th those lower notes don't get lost because we pull that top one down, it still has a pop to it, but those lower notes actually end up being louder in comparison to that first note. So instead of you've got and it, and it pulls those little turns up in relation to that loudest note if we use it well. Um, and even if we squeeze it too hard, you're hearing a you still have that ba. There's still a there's still a different attack on that first note, so we we may lose some sonic or some uh, dynamic expression, but we don't lose the um, we don't lose the timbral, is that the right word? The timbral uh, expression. So here are some other pros and cons, and these might be pros or cons depending on how you look at them. Compression tends to bring up your low frequencies. I don't mean low volume; it does that too and it brings down your high volumes. It also brings up your low frequencies and brings down your high frequencies. And that's just the way compression works. Now, um, you might have noticed on the little compressor that I showed you, there's a bunch of buttons across the top and we'll look at this again when I do another demo, um, that there are different models of compressors in there. Every circuit acts and sounds a little different. When we start running sounds through electric circuits, each one sounds and acts a little different. So each compressor is going to do this differently, but in general, compressors will sort of uh, amplify low frequencies and pull down high frequencies. Excuse me, I had a delicious lunch today. Just had it twice. So they will bring up low frequencies and bring down high frequencies. And that's one thing that we listen for to say, wow, I think maybe you've over compressed that mix. It's sounding a little dull. So, you know, we'll listen that there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of um, dynamic expression. And wow, it sounds like somebody took a sander to it. It's just, it's a little too dull. Uh, one of the other things that you can have if you don't manage your compressor well, and I didn't 
put a slide for this just popped into my head. It's called pumping. And if you set your attack and release times wrong, what you'll notice is that compressors kicking in and out. It'll be it, the whole thing will start pumping. You'll hear it attacking and releasing and you'll get sort of this Humpty Dumpty sound and you'll hear it grabbing and letting go. If, if that's the case, you're going to need to tighten down those attack and release times um, in order to stop it from pumping. So if you hear your compressor pumping, that's generally because you've got some problems with your attack and release times. So how and when to use compression. I don't really use much compression on my rig. I spent the last almost 50 years trying to get my right hand to work right. Um, and so I have well, a fair amount of control if I'm going to, if I do say so myself, I've got a fair amount of control with my right hand. I feel like I've got the ability to really control my volume on every note. I leave that for front of house and I just understand that, yes, they are going to compress me because they are going to have to get me into a mix. That's their job. I let them handle that. Not a problem. I only hire front of house people that I trust anyway. I do use compression on some effects that are kind of peaky. And I was just thinking I do actually use it if I'm trying to do a pits section. I will usually put some compression on that to help my pits have a little more sustain. So there are some effects that are pretty peaky like wah or auto wah. And uh, here comes a, another little demo on that. Uh, I'm going to slide over here. Sorry, you're not going to see any of this, but I am. Um, where did that go? Here it is. Sorry, I'm kind of adjusting some, some things here. And let's turn this compressor off so that we can hear. Here is some wah. Now, one thing you might notice with a wah pedal is when you put your heel down, there's, there's, it's pretty quiet. And when you put your toe down, it's pretty loud. So compression is going to be a, a thing that's going to help us sit that a little, uh, a little tighter. So listen again. So the notes where I've got my toe down, you can hear those are popping out. And then the ones where I've got my heel down, they're kind of getting lost a little bit. And if that was in a mix, if I've got a guitar player going or something, you're not going to hear those notes at all. I might as well just not play them. But if we put some compression on, let's turn the compressor on. And then we'll, uh, we'll look at our meter first. So it's helping to pull that thing in a little bit. We can look at the graph here. So on my Helix, uh, which is what I use for all my processing, I've got it set to when I click on my uh, wah pedal, it also clicks on a compressor that's right after that wah pedal. And that's a nice thing about some of these more advanced um, multi-effects pedals is you can assign multiple things to one switch. So when I switch on my wah pedal, it, it also kicks on a compressor. Now, I, I hadn't told you, and uh, Damon is, is right, there's a bunch of different uh, sounds here. Let's, let's hear if, some, if we can hear the difference on these. So yeah, you can definitely hear that each one of those compressors sounds a little different. And it's just, again, it's an artistic decision. How do I want this thing to sound, right? Um, so I'm going to come back to here. Come to the next thing. My computer is going to freak out. It's all good. Yes, I know that I changed the interface. All right. Ah, 
a little behind the scenes there. So how and when to use compression. Uh, I said that I generally don't use it much except for after a while. And if you've got a, uh, a helix, it's easy. It's just one of the blocks that's in there. But if you are using stomp boxes, well, one of the things you may want to do is grab a compressor pedal. And you may find, if you're looking for those, that they're called sustain pedals because they're mostly made for guitars. And that's what guitar players use them for is sustain, just like that diagram that we showed earlier. So they're not going to be labeled threshold, ratio, makeup, knee, attack, release, none of that. Each one of the knobs on that pedal, uh, they're going to do something a little different. So you're going to have to read the manual to kind of understand. They'll go, oh, what amount or uh, level. Level of compression is kind of a, it's kind of an amalgam of threshold and ratio. Now, how much sustain do you want? Well, what that's doing is it's changing that threshold and ratio so that it's compressing more. So you have to kind of read between the lines uh, in the manuals of those compressor pedals to figure out exactly what they're doing. Um, where would I want to put a compressor in my signal chain? We talked about EQ. I want to EQ early and often. So I'm going to have EQ in a lot of different places in my effects chain. Compression, where do I want to put that? Well, I want to put it after anything that's going to affect sort of my level, like a, an auto wah. So I may want to put it after my auto wah, and then I want to put it before anything that I'm kind of worried that I'm going to peek out. Um, I also want to put it before my solo boost, because if my solo boost is boosting me, say, 4 dB, but then I put that before my compressor, well, the compressor is going to compress that 4 dB, and now it's basically not a boost anymore, right? So the other thing to be aware of are your volume-dependent effects, like distortion or auto wah. The louder your signal is going into a distortion or an auto wah, the more it's going to distort or the more it's going to wah. So if I put a compressor before distortion or before auto wah, I'm not going to have as much control over that effect as I would have had before, at least the volume dependent aspects of that effect. So I may want to put my compression after that, unless my auto wah is too sensitive. Like I feel like I don't like it's too it's too trippy, man. It's it's too it's too reactive. Well, then maybe if I put a little compressor before that auto wah, it's going to tame it down and make it a little more forgiving. And uh, and so just just think about the compression is shrinking my dynamic range. Do I want it to be before these effects or after these effects? And just use your head there. Um, so the. I've got two more slides here real quick, and then we'll get to some of these comments and questions because there's some really good ones here. Um, there is another device called a limiter, which is a form of a compressor. And what it does is it sets a maximum volume. It is a hard limit. There is no more, like the little dude with the fader, they can go all the way to the floor, right? If you exceed the threshold by 20 dB, he's pulling that thing down by 20 dB. And so it's, it's, it's a compressor with an infinite ratio, not two to one, five to one, it's, it's two trillion to one. And we use that to protect our gear or our ears from spikes. Imagine if you're wearing in-ear monitors and you've got your vocal mic going into that thing and you've got it set pretty loud because you want to be able to hear yourself singing and some drunk fool runs up on your stage and grabs a mic and goes, woo! Right? You don't need all that coming to your ears. That would be really bad. And you're probably going to slug somebody. So we would always put a, a limiter in the signal chain with our in-ear monitors. And I would set it, you know, pretty high. I don't want to hear that limiter kicking in, but I do want it to protect me. Or if somebody knocks over my mic stand, which of course that would never happen, right? But your mic stand falls over and hits the ground. Pow! You don't want that thing coming and blasting your eardrums out of your head. The other thing that we'll do if we're installing a PA system, we will always install a limiter as sort of the last thing in that PA system so that if somebody, some idiot plugs in their, their iPod without muting the channel first and you get this huge pop, it's not going to blast the speaker cones right out of the cabinets. So a limiter is a thing that we would always use with in-ears. We would use it in a PA kind of at the very end of the signal chain and hopefully nobody's ever going to hit that limiter but it's there to protect you. 
Uh, and then the opposite of a compressor is called, believe it or not, an expander. And what it does is it makes, I set a threshold and above that threshold, if I exceed that threshold by two dB and I've got a two to one ratio, the little guy with the fader instead of pulling down, he's actually pushing up. So instead of me exceeding that ratio, uh, that threshold by two dB, now it's four. And why would I use that? Well, if I want more dynamic range, and one of the things I can do with more dynamic range, I can use it a little bit like a gate. Say I've got a mic on my violin, and when I'm playing, boy, it sure is picking up a lot of violin, but then when I stop playing, wow, it's picking up a lot of stuff on the stage. I can use a gate on that, and what, I would, what a gate does is it basically doesn't allow anything through until we get to a certain level. Or I could use an expander to say, um, I actually use it more on a vocal mic. I use it on a vocal mic. If I'm standing in front of my vocal mic and there's a drummer behind me and I'm singing into my vocal mic and then when I step aside, my head has been shielding that mic from the drums. But when I step aside, now that that drummer all that cymbal sound is going to be coming in into my mic and going into my in-ears. So I step away from my mic and all of a sudden those cymbals are killing me. An expander will actually solve that. So I would put an expander on my vocal mic, but probably just going into my ears. And that way, when I step away from my mic, I'm still getting a little bit of stage sound, a little bit of presence from that drum, but it's not really slamming into my ears. And, uh, and that's just, that's what an expander does. Okay. So that is compression. That's a lot. I know it's a lot. It's a lot of math too, but we got some comments to get to. All right. So here, um, I'll try to hit some of these. I agree. Opto compressors are smoother. Yeah. Especially in the studio. I really like optical compressors. I used to own a manly, uh, ELOP, the electro optical compressor. That's a really common thing to use in a studio is an opto compressor. And it's the way it works, it's optical. Uh, the way the Manly works, I think, uh, if I remember, it was a long, long time ago and I've slept many times since then. It's got a tube that your signal runs through there and the more signal, the brighter the tube gets. And then there is an, there's an optical sensor that reads how many uh, uh, lumens are coming off of that tube. And the brighter that tube is, the more it compresses. So it, it's based on, it's, it's actually a, a, a variable ratio um, compressor. So the, the more your signals, so it's almost like a, an, uh, a dynamic limiter. Uh, so I do like opto compressors. Um, yeah, they, they sound great. Uh, try to come back and catch some of these other ones. What all, oh, oh okay. Mexico's here. Hey, Mexico, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Awesome, thank you all for coming. Joseph Shackford is generally a Nashville guy, but I have no idea where he is in the world right now. Not classically trained. Congratulations, you made it. Um, I don't know what that says. I hope it's really nice, but thank you for being here. Um, teaching myself cello. So any string information? Yeah. Uh, I It took me decades to learn all of this stuff because I had to do it on the job. There wasn't any, there wasn't no Matt Bell videos back in the day. I had to just learn all this stuff and it took forever. Oh, Egypt. Thanks for being here from Egypt. That's awesome. So I got two pedals, a compressor and a delay. And what order should I connect them? Well, it depends. That's the answer to everything. Uh, if we, so think about this, the way a delay works is it's, it, you'll hear like da da ba 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 ba, right? So you'll have a, a an initial signal, which is what you played. And then your then there will be a, a, a couple of repeats, and those repeats are decreasing in volume. If I put the compressor before the delay, it's going to smooth out my playing, and then the delay is just going to do what it does. Okay. If I put a compressor after the delay, then what it's essentially going to do is shrink the range of those repeats. So if the first repeat was half the volume of the initial note, and the next one's half the volume of that. If I have a compressor in there, it's going to make that ratio a little different. So instead of getting bop, 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 I might get bop, 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 bop. So I might, it could affect the way my delay and the decay of my delay works. So the answer to your question is, I don't know, which one do you want? Um, generally, I would put a compressor, personally, I would, in most cases, would put a compressor before the delay 
because I want with my my controls on my delay pedal, I want to have the ability to control how fast those things are decaying. And I and, and if I start change if I put the compressor after delay, then as I'm changing the settings on my delay pedal, they're going to act like they're not very responsive. Like I'm trying to turn down the level of these repeats and they're not coming down very much. It's because my compressor is affecting that. So I would generally put a compressor before the delay, um, but there might be some artistic reasons that you would want to put it after the delay. That's entirely up to you. Uh, next. Yeah, hypercompression is bad, or maybe. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's exactly what you want. The Boss CS2 level tone sustain. I don't know. I don't remember. I... I have, I have messed with those pedals, but it's been a minute. Level would be uh, how loud the whole pedal is. So level is going to be like the overall output volume of that pedal, independent of any compression that you're doing. So if you put level on zero, nothing's coming out of that pedal. And if you put the level on maximum, then the maximum amount of sound is going to come through. Uh, sustain is going to be how much it's compressing. And that's kind of an amalgam of threshold and ratio. Um, tone, remember that we said that compressors will raise the low frequencies and pull down the high frequencies. Tone allows me to compensate for that a little bit. If I'm doing a fair amount of compression, if I'm a guitar player and I want a lot of sustain, but I don't want it to sound all dead inside, then I will turn that tone up. And that replaces some of those high frequencies that I killed when I started compressing a lot. So that's what tone does on most compressors. A lot of them do have a tone, sort of a makeup tone. We've got makeup volume. Some of them will have a makeup tone as well. Um, so, oh, and attack. Yep, so attack is gonna be on there too. Um, and that's just how fast does it grab. And for a guitar player, what that means is, you know, when they hit that note with a pick, if they have a slow attack, it's going to allow that pick sound to really pop through there. And then it's going to compress and give them the sustain they want. If they have a very low attack, then the compression is going to work on the pick too. So that, you know, if I'm picking that thing pretty hard, um, maybe I don't, maybe my pick sound is too strong if I've compressed the note down. Because, you know, the, the difference between my pick sound and the note sound what attack does is allow me to, to kind of control that ratio a little bit between how loud is my pick sound versus how loud is my note. Does that make sense? Um, opto can be smoother compression. Yep. So I am not totally studied up on exactly how all these different types of compressors work. Uh, for me, I kind of listen. If I put a, if I'm using a fair amount of compression on something, and it's in logic and I have a bunch of options on which compressor I'm going to use, I'll just flip through them. Uh, how does that one sound? How does this one sound? How does this, well, I like the third one best, so that's the one I use. Uh, not very scientific, but that's, you know, that's how it goes. Um, yes, yeah, some of these can distort. I actually dig that. I was listening to some of these on, on, the, uh, on the demo that I did for the wah pedal you could hear that some of them were adding some distortion. You're like, actually, kind of like that. Put a little bit of, put a little bit of attitude on it, a little stank on it. Um, I like that. I like a little stank. So hopefully, hopefully that's very helpful. Um, and yeah, so yeah, sometimes we want a little bit of distortion. Generally when we're using wah, which, which is when I use compressors a lot, is when I'm using wah, um, I kind of like a little bit of, I like a little bit of grind on that. Um, as, uh, as, um, Greg Cock, one of my favorite guitar players, he would say, put a little gristle on it. So I like a little gristle on there. All right. That was very involved and a little bit nerdy. And, uh, I didn't have any artist, any special artist guests here. None of the, uh, another special artist wanted to talk about compression. It's not nearly as sexy as some of the other. Uh, effects, but it's important. It's really important to understand compression. And, you know, the, the little discussion I had with somebody before on the, uh, on, on Facebook, it's, I think it's misunderstood. I think people don't understand that there are, there is compression on everything you hear. 
when you're live, if the engineer is worth anything, there's some compression in there. If you're listening to recorded music, there are lots and lots of compressors on those things. There's probably compression in the microphone. If they're using a tube mic or a ribbon mic, there's probably some compression on that. There's definitely compression on the channel as they're recording. Then there's compression on the overall mix. And then they're going to master that thing and compress it some more. And then when it goes to broadcast, they're going to compress it again. And then if it's coming through Spotify, Spotify compresses it again. And if it's coming through your car radio, your car radio compresses it again. There is so much compression on the things you hear. But if it's done well, it makes things sound better, not worse. So uh, to, to a blanket statement of compression doesn't work on strings is just it's just factually wrong. If it does work on strings, it works on everything. And like it or not, it's on everything. So there is lots of compression going on. It's helpful to understand it. Um, but once we understand it, then we can make sure that we don't use it poorly because they are right in saying that if you use compression poorly, yeah, it sounds bad. Uh, it can squash the life out of things and make them really dull and, and lifeless and unexpressive. So uh, again, I hope that's helpful. We're actually going to take a little break from this series. I will be here next Wednesday, and I think we have a guest next Wednesday, uh, uh, an artist, and I'm really excited about talking to them. Um, I won't tell you exactly who yet, but we uh, we do have an artist we're going to chat with next week, and um, and then I will probably take off the week between Christmas and New Year's. I'm doing seven services at DPAC. Uh, Christmas weekend, I'm going to be exhausted. And then I'm flying to Vermont to do a thing on New Year's. So I'll probably take that week off and then we'll come back in January and we will start this effects on violin series back up with some more guests and some more effects. And this will be some of the more sexier, funner effects. In fact, let me see if I can pull up, speaking of nerdy stuff, um, I've got a spreadsheet here with all of the... Um, with all of the things I'm doing. So let me see if I can open this while I'm talking to you guys. And who do I have? Let's see, we've got, here's what we got coming up. We got wah, distortion, pitch shifting, and that'll probably be two weeks. We got fuzz. You'll never guess who the guest is on fuzz. Uh, talk box, reverb. We may do a couple of weeks on reverb. Delay. Uh, we're doing synth. We'll probably do a whole week on order of effects. Um, string section, that's one that everybody wants to know. Is there an effect that can make me sound like a string section? Um, yeah, it's some combined effects, yes. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, I've got one called Weird Stuff. Uh, I've got an artist who, that's they do weird stuff, and I don't know what else to call it, so we're just going to call it Weird Stuff until he tells me otherwise. Uh, modulators, filters. Uh, we're probably going to spend a whole week with the Helix. We'll probably spend a whole week with the Eventide. Um, and there's some artists that are, that that's their whole sound is messing with the helix or whatever. So, um, or messing with the eventide. And so we've got some artists in here. I think I've got a total of 17 or 18 weeks planned right now. And we are on week five right now. So yeah, there's going to be a bunch of these coming. We'll probably be into March by the time we finish this series. So, uh, yeah, I'm not mad. Uh, not mad about that at all. I <laughs> went to the wrong camera. Uh, so, all right, let's, uh, let's answer this question. So I will say there is, if you've been listening to me very long, you will hear me say, you'll hear it in my voice. You hear, there's no such thing as the best. There's only what's best for you in your particular situation without knowing any details about what your requirements are. I cannot answer that question. There are a bunch of different pitch shifters and they're all different. So, um, the answer is, I can't give you an answer to that. It's like asking what's the best food. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the best food is. What's the best car. I don't know. Um, it depends and it depends on a whole lot of stuff. So we, when we talk about pitch shifting, we will talk about uh, a number of the things that come along with pitch shifting. And then you'll understand why I would love to answer your question, but there's not an answer to your question. Um, people do ask that question a lot. What is the best amp? What's the best violin? What's the best bow? What's the best wireless? There is no best. There's no such thing as best. If there was a best, 
then they would be the only one that anybody sold, right? Um, there is only a best for you in your situation in your budget. I guess maybe that's that's what I, sh I should add that. The best one for you in your situation, your budget. Uh, what's the best violin out there? I, I don't know, probably an $18 million Guarneri. Uh, but you don't have $18 million and neither do I. Uh, if I had $18 million, I wouldn't be on YouTube right now. And if you had $18 million, you wouldn't be watching me. So uh, yeah, that there you go. There's the best. But what's the best one for you and your situation in your budget? I don't know. I would have to know a lot more details than that. But once we have our discussion about pitch shifters, then you will know kind of what the options are and you'll know what things to look for. I'll say, well, this one does this and this one does this and this one does that. You go, okay, don't like that, don't like that, do like that. Well, then you would know. You, you would have a better idea of what's going to be best for you. And I feel like being an educated consumer allows you to make the best possible decisions for yourself with your money. Uh, all this stuff, I had to just learn all this stuff. I had to figure all this out on my own. And I spent a lot of time and a lot of money figuring all this out, buying stuff kind of sight unseen. Like you kind of go to a guitar shop and try it with your violin, but that ain't the same as taking it out on the road. And you'd buy one and go, well, didn't really do exactly what I was hoping it would do. Hey, can I return this? No, man, you've had it for three weeks. Well, I guess I have to sell it uh, or I'll just stick it in my drawer of bad decisions. Uh, so yeah, I have several drawers of bad decisions. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Depends. <laughs> I love that. Um, I like some of the Walrus Audio stuff. I love the EHX stuff. Honestly, I have not found a pitch shifter that really, really makes me super excited because every one of them changes the tone. And what I really want in my little tiny mind is I want, I want it to just change the note without changing the tone. And what we learn in our EQ class, if you look, if you study in RTA, um, that what a note sounds like, there's the fundamental frequency and then there's all those overtones that come with it. You know what happens when you shift pitches? It shifts your root pitch. It also shifts all your overtones. And it's, well, now all of those, if I'm going up an octave, my root pitch goes up an octave, but all my overtones go up an octave. And the bow scratch goes up an octave. And, you know, the, the sound of my finger sliding up the fingerboard goes up an octave. What I really want is one that moves the fundamental frequency and it moves some of the overtones, but not all of them. And, you know, AI may eventually get there. But we're nowhere near that right now. We're using just dumb circuits and these things. And this is a, uh, it's a pedal that costs $200. What do you want it to do, right? It's just going to shift all the frequencies. If you had a pedal that cost $200,000, well, maybe it could do that. Um, but for $200,000, I'll just hire another fiddle player and make them play it up an octave. Um, so, uh, yes, Eventide has some really amazing stuff. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about the week that we talk about Eventide. Because it is, it's sort of... I guess it's got effects in it, but it's also sort of its own thing. So uh, I'm the one that decides what the categories are, and I decide that the Eventide counts as its own week. So there you go. Uh, any other questions, comments, criticisms? You guys don't like my shirt or whatever, you know, whatever you want to say. Here's my shirt. There you go. All right. If you don't like the skull, uh, too bad. All right. Hope that was cool for everybody. I enjoy talking about compression and all that sort of thing. I, I'm kind of nerdy. I like talking about gain structure too. All these things are, they're not as sexy as reverb or distortion, but they're super important. And if you don't understand these things, then when you start applying, uh, you know, flanders and phasers and all that other stuff, then you're not, it's not going to sound as good as you want it to sound because you don't understand the fundamentals. All right. Well, I guess that is it. Uh, if another comment or two comes in in the next few seconds, I'll grab it. If not, I'll tell you guys to have a fantastic weekend. I hope the holiday season, whatever holiday, what, whatever holiday you celebrate during the season, I hope it's a great one. I hope that you, uh, I hope you get some great gifts. I hope you get one of these as a gift. That'd be awesome. And uh, yeah. So next week, we're talking to an artist that I'm super excited about. And then the week after I'll probably take off and then I'll see you, I'll see you cats again 
in January. Maybe the next two weeks off. I don't know. Um, but next week, this coming week, Wednesday, we will be here. It won't be part of this Effects on Violin series. It'll actually be something interesting. How do you like that? Okay. See you guys in uh, in seven days and then a couple weeks after that. Peace.